Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Matt Greco. I'm the events manager at Life University for PSS. Uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We have a, a packed presentation to give you, and we'll start just in a minute. I'm going to give a few seconds to let everybody sign on. We have a big turnout today, a lot of interest in today's program. Um, I just uh, want to remind you that we have other events coming up on PSS, so please do check our events page. In fact, we have a medic care program next week, as well as a program on um, the changing sexual preferences of older adults. All right, so we do have a full presentation this afternoon. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to the Lamson and Kuttner people to uh, take it from here. Okay, hello. Uh, my name is Cindy Custer. I'm the Director of Institutional Relations at uh, Lamson and Kuttner. And today we have uh, pres the presentation will be done by David Kuttner, uh, one of the founding partners of Lamson and Kuttner. And our other attorney, Julia Santo, will be uh, monitoring and uh, uh, answering questions. We're happy to have you ask questions during the event. We think that's actually very helpful. So uh, uh, if the question makes sense at the moment, Julia can interrupt David and ask him, or if it makes more sense for her to answer it in the chat, she's happy to do that as well. So we ask that you ask your questions in the chat. Uh, we like that because then uh, they don't go away if they get answered. So uh, please, uh, uh, questions uh, should be asked in the chat. And I am now going to turn it over to David. Well, thank you, Cindy. Um, and welcome, everyone. Today, we're going to be uh, talking about community Medicaid 2023, as you can see on the screen. And uh, there is our law firm, Lampson and Kuttner. We have two offices, one in Manhattan, one in Westchester. And we focus on elder law and estate planning, as you can see. Uh, today's event is, of course, sponsored by uh, PSS Circle of Care. And uh, we want to uh, thank PSS very much for inviting us again to uh, speak to you. Uh, and we really are grateful and, and respectful and, and admire all that uh, PSS does for the community. So uh, thank you very much to PSS for sponsoring not only our event, but uh, so many great events. So uh, I like to start here with uh, a discussion about uh, Medicaid and long-term care, because I think most of us, and I have to say, I was shocked the first time I saw this statistic, which comes from the US Department of Health, that seven out of 10 people will need long-term care of some kind at some point in their lives, and about four out of 10 uh, will need nursing home care. And if you know anything at all about long-term care, uh, you know that it is very expensive. Uh, particularly in the New York metropolitan area. Uh, it's expensive every day and it's expensive because it's long-term and it adds up. And it's the kind of expense when people are paying for it out of their own pocket, uh, it really eats up their life savings and even puts their homes in jeopardy in some cases. So it's really something to pay attention to. It's not a happy subject. But I think for those who uh, think about it and plan around it, uh, there's a lot of peace of mind in, in doing that, knowing that you have uh, protected yourself, your spouse, your children, your family uh, against this really very significant financial risk. Uh, I think probably the most significant financial risk for most seniors so unless you're very, very wealthy, uh, it really is something to uh, think about and plan around. So my next slide here is about Medicare because we find in our law practice that so many people think that uh, they're fine, I'm covered, I have Medicare. Well, yes and no, uh, Medicare is a very good insurance. Uh, it does cover hospitals and doctors and rehab centers and 
providers of all kinds. Uh, but what Medicare does not cover is long-term care. So if you or a family member should need uh, an aid in the home or a care in, a, in an assisted living facility or nursing home care, uh, none of those expenses are covered by Medicare. Uh, every once in a while, a client will say to us, well, you know, I know somebody who's in a nursing home and Medicare is paying the bill. Well, that might be so if they're in that nursing home for rehab, for rehabilitation. But if that's the case, uh, the absolute limit is 100 days that Medicare will pay for. And typically, rehab is much shorter than 100 days. And further, uh, Medicare will only pay 100% for the first 20 days. And for the rest, uh, they'll cover 80%. And that's why many of you have uh, supplemental policies. So anyway, just be aware of that. Uh, Medicare is a terrific medical insurance. It is not long-term care insurance. So who does pay? for long-term care. Well, you can see on this slide, private pay, that's your own money, which uh, you'd rather not do. And uh, in most cases probably cannot afford. Uh, there is long-term care insurance uh, for those who have purchased long-term care insurance. Um, most people don't have it. And I'll go into why that might be in a moment. Uh, then there is adult children uh, who sometimes are burdened with taking care of their parents. And uh, then we have Medicaid, which we'll spend most of our time on today. So just uh, kind of a quick uh, few thoughts about long-term care insurance. Uh, it, of course, is a matter for, of underwriting. So your age and your state of health uh, play a significant part in whether it's available at all. And of course, uh, also the premium that you'll pay. And the older you are, the greater the premium is going to be. So those who have thought about long-term care insurance when they were maybe in their 50s, uh, that's a whole different ball game than somebody who's already in their late 60s or 70s, uh, because the premium, if they can get the insurance at all, is going to be a lot higher. Uh, and then I think the most important question here is how much insurance do you need if you if you're thinking about long term care insurance? And you know the the problem is, and and we see this all too often that uh, a client says, well, I'm all set regarding my long-term uh, care. I have a uh, long-term care insurance. And then I always say, well, that's great, but let me take a look at your policy and we'll see what kind of insurance you have and how much insurance you have. And these policies are written so the benefit is likely to be a, a, an amount uh, per day. And there's probably a maximum amount that the insurance will cover. So then I have to ask this question. If you have, let's say, $100 a day or $150 a day of insurance with a cap of maybe $300,000, uh, what are you going to do if the actual cost is $300 or $400 or $500 a day? Uh, where is the money coming to fill the gap between the actual cost and the amount of insurance you have? Well, all too often, the answer is, well, gee, I don't know. I guess I'll have to take money out of my savings. Well, that's really not a very good answer uh, because you're going to be depleting your assets uh, maybe a little bit slower because the insurance is going to pay a small part of the cost. But in the end, uh, you may find that you have used up your life savings and wind up on Medicaid. If that's the case, why did you buy the policy in the first place? 
So I think there really should be some analysis, uh, financial analysis that goes into uh, whether to buy and if so, how much to buy. And if your answer is, you know, I've got very good uh, cash flows, I have social security, I have a pension, I have uh, required minimum distributions from my retirement accounts. So I, I really have more income than I'm spending every month. So if I do have to fill the gap between my insurance and the actual cost, uh, that money will come out of my income. Okay, that's a good answer because uh, it says that the assets are going to be protected. And that's really the primary function of having the insurance in the first place. Uh, anyway, uh, bottom line, can you get the insurance? Uh, can you get as much as you need or that makes sense? And can you afford the premium? Uh, these are the questions that we're going to ask if you're asking for our advice about long-term care insurance. We don't sell insurance, uh, so we're a very uh, neutral and objective party if, uh, if advice is needed on this subject. So now let's turn to uh, Medicaid, which is the main topic for our discussion today. I uh, wanted to show you with this slide the scope of our community Medicaid pro uh, program in New York. And I think we should all be very happy and pleased to know that New York, without any doubt, has the best Medicaid program in the country. And while Medicaid is a, is a national program in the sense that there's federal money and federal law involved, it's a program that is managed in partnership with the states. And the state's role is very significant in the Medicaid program. It really depends uh, very much on state money uh, and it also depends very much on state law. Uh, some states make it difficult to uh, become eligible for benefits. And uh, once you are eligible, they're not providing very much in the way of benefits. And that description applies to a lot of our states. And then we have those states that uh, go in the opposite direction and looking to help out their seniors. Uh, who need care and need help in this area. And I think without any doubt, as I said, New York uh, does the most for our senior population. The laws are uh, friendlier, if I could express it that way. Uh, they make it easier for you to become eligible for Medicaid, as, as you'll see uh, uh, in the rest of this program today. Uh, and also, we put a lot more money into our program than uh, most of the states, uh, really any of the states. Uh, we, we put in 25 times more per capita than many states do in their Medicaid program. Uh, so very quickly, you can see, uh, you know, the big part, uh, big parts of the program or the home care, the assisted living care, which is available in New York. Uh, in many of the facilities, and uh, of course, um, uh, medical care, hospital care, and so on. Um, so let me move on, and we'll talk about community Medicaid eligibility. And I guess the first thing I want to say is just be aware that we're talking about community Medicaid. And community Medicaid are these programs here. Uh, it does not include nursing home care. Uh, nursing home care has uh, different eligibility uh, requirements. So today we're talking about community Medicaid. Uh, I think the first point and the most important one is eligibility is based on what Medicaid calls your resources. And resources are assets. Uh, not every asset <clears throat> uh, that you have 
uh, the focus is on your financial assets and real property and certain uh, property like co-ops and timeshares would also be included, but uh, resources uh, is not not including your stamp collection, your car, your jewelry, uh, your uh, tangible personal property. Uh, the focus is really on those assets that are uh, liquid or uh, can be easily converted to liquid assets like uh, real property. And here's the other important point. Income is not an eligibility factor. And so often I hear and we hear people saying, well, I was told that I'm not eligible for Medicaid because I have too much income. That is just wrong. I don't know where that advice uh, came from. Uh, obviously someone who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. Uh, income, again, is not a factor of eligibility, but there are rules about income. And uh, the rule here is that if you're on community Medicaid, you have uh, community Medicaid benefits, uh, you are limited to uh, $1,677 per month uh, in income. However, uh, you don't have to lose your so-called surplus income. The surplus income being uh, your monthly income that exceeds 1,677. Uh, you have a choice here. You can take your surplus and contribute it to the cost of care, or you can open an account with a pooled income trust. So the pooled income trust is a special trust that has as its purpose the protection of your surplus income if you are on the community Medicaid program. So just to take a simple example, let's say your monthly income, looking at your social security, your distributions from retirement plans, your pension, whatever you have, uh, let's say that amount is 3677 So under Medicaid's definition, uh, you have $2,000 of surplus income. So now you can decide, do I want to give Medicaid that $2,000 or do I want to open an account with a pooled income trust where that money remains available to me to pay for my expenses and really anything that I want, as long as it's for me. Uh, bearing in mind that the job of the pooled income trust is to make sure that you're spending your money on yourself. You're not allowed to spend it on anybody else or even give it to charity. It is only there for you. And if you don't use it and someday you uh, move into a nursing home or you pass on, uh, the remaining balance would be uh, simply given to the charity that the pool income trust supports. David, we have a question that is a, a quick one to answer, but I think it's a good question to answer out loud. Is social security considered income? Yes. Social Security is definitely monthly income. You get a check or deposit uh, every month from Social Security if you're receiving retirement income. Uh, that is income and it's counted for Medicaid purposes, as are your distributions from retirement plans. Uh, bearing in mind when you reach a certain age, there are required minimum distributions from your IRA or your 401k or your 403b or whatever you may have in the way of a retirement plan. That's income. Uh, and obviously pension payments or income, rents or income, whatever you may be receiving as income uh, every month, Medicaid's going to count it. And when you apply for Medicaid, 
uh, Medicaid will uh, give a budget, which will show how much income you have. And if you have a surplus of any significant amount, uh, that's the time that you want to show Medicaid that you have a pooled income trust account. Okay, so, and, you know, and David, it. where can you open a pooled income trust account? Well, there are uh, several uh, of these pooled income trusts that are uh, authorized to provide uh, services in New York. Uh, if you did an internet search for pooled income trust, I'm sure you would find uh, uh, quite a few uh, offering accounts in New York. Uh, and if you co uh, contact our law firm, we'd be happy to provide a list to you as well. Uh, these are all uh, public uh, entities. Uh, they all have uh, charitable purposes and uh, they're all uh, authorized by the state of New York. The money that uh, is deposited in your account uh, is going to be in a bank account at a major bank. Uh, and the money again is available to you for any expenses or uh, goods or services that you wish to purchase for yourself. Okay. Okay, Anything? sorry, one more. <laughs> oh, one more, okay. Okay, can a pooled trust deny a person money in their account? Uh, yes, if the uh, payment is for somebody else. You know, if you ask the pooled income trust to pay your granddaughter's college tuition, uh, they're not going to pay it because they are required to control how money is spent from the trust. Um, and it, again, uh, you have to spend it on yourself. But that being said, you know, you can spend it however you want as long as it's for you. So if you decide that you want a, I don't know, an 80 inch uh, flat screen TV with surround sound, uh, for your home, uh, no reason why you can't buy that with money in the pooled income trust. But uh, if you want to buy that flat screen TV for your son or your daughter or your grandchild, uh, they will not allow the purchase. Okay, are we ready to move on, Julia? Um. I believe so, yes. I'm, I'm going to answer the other questions in the chat, although I ask that everybody start writing the questions to all, to everyone, because I'm getting these questions sent to me privately. So please send them to everyone so that the entire group can see my responses. Thank you. Okay. Uh... So that's a slide about what is a pooled income trust. I've already uh, uh, spoken quite a bit about the pooled income trust. Uh, anybody who is applying for uh, benefits with community Medicaid, home care, assisted living care, adult day care, and so on, uh, there won't be any problem in opening a pooled income trust account. And I guess I've already spoken about this one too. Uh, again, you can uh, pay any expense that you have, your rent, your uh, co-op or condo uh, common charges, your mortgage, your credit cards. Uh, by the way, some of the pooled income trusts will give you a debit card uh, that debits to your pool trust account. So if you're in the grocery store or the drug store, uh, you can just pull out your uh, debit card that the uh, pooled income trust gave you and pay with that, and it will debit to your pooled income trust account. And by the way, all of you will receive a copy of the uh, slides that you're looking at today. So you'll, uh, you know, if you're scribbling notes as fast as you can, you, you will get these slides. 
Um, David, I'm sorry, I have another one. Um, okay, so someone is asking about when Medicaid denied a claim for home care in New York City because the trust was using principal to pay for trust property. Um, I think, and there's a few other questions here that are, I believe, getting confused with an irrevocable asset protection trust. So if you could just briefly explain the difference. Okay. Uh, yeah, I was thinking that question is really not addressed to the pooled income trust. Again, the pooled income trust is for your surplus monthly income. That's what goes into the pooled income trust. And the surplus is the excess amount above the Medicaid limit. The Medicaid limit this year in 2023 is $1,677. That number changes every year. Uh, next year, it'll probably be a bit higher, but maybe not by much. Uh, but everything goes up, as we know. But again, pooled income trust is for income. I think that question that uh, Julia just uh, read uh, really is talking about assets that have been transferred to a different kind of trust, uh, probably an irrevocable asset protection trust that uh, we and other elder law firms use to protect clients' assets and to help them become eligible for Medicaid. So in that case, uh, it's very important that the trustee not use principal amounts for the benefit of the person who created the trust. Uh, because so that means uh, the trustee has given money to the creator or grantor, uh, has paid a bill on behalf of the creator of the trust. Uh, that's forbidden. And the whole idea of the of that type of trust is that you have transferred your assets to a trust and you no longer own those assets. They're no longer available to you. But if the principal in the trust is used for your benefit, then Medicaid will take the position that the trust assets are available to you and count them as your resources. And when they do that, you will not be eligible for Medicaid, and you will have defeated the purpose of creating that trust in the first place, which is to make yourself Medicaid eligible and to protect the assets in the trust. So if we have an asset protection trust, we wanna make sure that we really very carefully respect the rules and requirements that pertain to that type of trust. And again, the principal amounts in the trust as opposed to income, the principal amounts must not be distributed to the grantor or used for the benefit of the grantor of that trust. Okay, do you think I covered that, Julia? I think you did a very excellent job. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, let's move on and... Uh, so here is a uh, question that we get all the time. Uh, is my home exempt? Or put the way we usually hear it, is it not true that my home is exempt? I've heard my home is exempt. Well, no, not really. Whoever is telling you that is only giving you half of the story and that would be uh, unfortunate. Uh, because often a half-truth turns out to be a whole lie. And uh, there's a problem here. If you uh, have community Medicaid and you are living in your home and that's your primary residence, uh, Medicaid is not going to count that home as a resource. Uh, and 
owning that home will not make you ineligible for Medicaid. However, there will come a day, inevitably, when that home is no longer your primary residence. Uh, maybe you moved in with one of your children, maybe you moved to an assisted living, uh, maybe you moved into a nursing home, uh, maybe you died. Well, in any of those cases, uh, that home that once was your primary residence uh, is now no longer your primary residence. So if you still own it, uh, Medicaid's gonna put a lien on that home and they are going to seek to recover all of the money that they spent on your care uh, from the equity in the home. Uh, and if you die, they'll be looking to recover from your estate uh, all of the money that they spent uh, on you uh, from the equity in the home. Uh, so in a plan that is a good plan and a smart plan, uh, we really don't ever want to leave the home in the name of a Medicaid applicant because inevitably one day it will be the subject of a claim for reimbursement by Medicaid. Uh, typically, we'll want to protect that home by transferring it to the type of trust that I mentioned a couple of moments ago. Uh, that would typically be an irrevocable asset protection trust. And uh, among the reasons for doing that is uh, typically our clients and probably many of you have bought your home years ago and uh, that home is probably appreciated in value sometimes very significantly. Uh, when your children or whoever are your beneficiaries of that trust inherit <clears throat> that home from you, uh, they will get a nice tax benefit called a step up in basis, uh, which allows them to avoid capital gain tax uh, on all of the increase in value that accrued during your lifetime. And in many cases, that's a very, very significant benefit uh, that uh, you can confer on your uh, your children or your, your beneficiaries, if we're talking about appreciated assets. Uh, typically, homes fall in that category. And of course, these trusts have <clears throat> a lot of other advantages as well. So moving on, um, we wanted to uh, touch today on uh, some of the changes that have occurred in Medicaid, the community Medicaid program, uh, and some of the uh, changes that are going to be implemented uh, in the near future. And as we say on this slide, uh, you know, these are developments that we and really all of our uh, colleagues in elder law practice are following closely. Uh, the changes in the Medicaid program. Uh, it's important to us to be giving correct advice to our clients and it's important to uh, clients to receive the correct advice. So as things change, we, uh, we need to be on top of it. So, uh, you know, we've already talked about the um, eligibility level, the resource level, uh, and you can see there for Medicaid, some pretty significant changes this last year. <clears throat> the income limits went up significantly, as did the resource limits. Um, I don't know whether that's going to continue in future years, but you know, it does mean uh, for the resources that you can uh, keep a bit more money in your own name and still be eligible for Medicaid. Uh, and you can keep uh, more of your monthly income without putting it into a pooled income trust. Uh, so for many people that, you know, these, uh, these changes are significant ones. 
And you can see for a married couple, if uh, both of you need Medicaid benefits, uh, these are the uh, income limits and resource limits would, uh, that would apply for you co collectively. So now we're um, moving into another area, which is once you have <clears throat> uh, proven that you are financially eligible for Medicaid, uh, the next question is going to be, uh, what benefits do you qualify for uh, medically or, or health-wise? And Medicaid is moving away or has moved away from basically allowing uh, uh, the Medicaid plans, the uh, managed long-term care plans and the managed care plans to make these assessments uh, with inputs from you and your own doctors uh, to the so-called independent assessor. Uh, and they're also making the, the standard questions and assessment tools, I guess they call it, uh, that are used to determine the plan of care. Uh, they're getting a little bit more strict, I think, with the uh, goal of making it a bit more difficult to qualify for uh, care that becomes very expensive. Uh, so it's a way of Medicare trying to manage its, uh, its very significant uh, budget and expenditures. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the uh, Medicaid has established a so-called independent practitioner panel. Uh, so it will no longer be your own doctor who <clears throat> provides inputs about uh, or makes a determination about the care that you need. Uh, this will be someone who's on uh, Medicaid's panel who, by the way, as you can see, is not necessarily a medical doctor. Uh, might even be a, a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant that uh, the state has selected and put uh, on the uh, independent practitioner panel. So again, this means that um, uh, the amount of care, if it's a home care case, um, might look a little different uh, because of this determination rather than the one that might have been made by your own doctor. And uh, these are um, the new regulations regarding the activities of daily living, which are used to determine uh, how much uh, home care you're entitled to. So activities are, of daily living, uh, probably most of you are familiar with this, but uh, there are things like um, uh, ability to dress yourself, go to the bathroom by yourself, bathe yourself, uh, cook a meal for yourself, um, take care of your home yourself. Uh, the, this is the measure that is used in, uh, in home care uh, cases to determine how much care you need at home. And bear in mind that Home care does not mean that you're getting a nurse or a, medi uh, a medical professional. Uh, home care means that you're getting an aide to uh, assist you with activities of daily living. So that aide is there to help you get dressed, to help you go to the bathroom, uh, to help bathe you, to make sure you don't fall in the bath or the shower. Uh, to cook a meal for you. Uh, this is what the home aid is doing. So <clears throat> under the current rules, uh, and by the way, these are the this is the same type of test that is used in 
uh, just about all of the uh, long-term care insurance policies, uh, they're looking at the ADLs. Uh, and typically you have to need assistance with two or more ADLs, which is the current regulation. But as you can see <clears throat> next year, uh, in order to be eligible for home care, you're going to need uh, assistance with at least three activities of daily living. Uh, except for those who have a diagnosis of dementia or Alzheimer's disease, uh, you're going to need uh, assistance and supervision with at least two of the ADLs. <clears throat> I'm not sure why they didn't just say two instead of more than one, but in any event, uh, that's how the regulation is going to read or does read. And uh, Medicaid is also eliminating the uh, housekeeping services. <clears throat> now, uh, let's take a look at <clears throat> this new uh, regulation regarding a look back. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, this would be a very significant change in our community Medicaid program. Uh, we have never had in New York a look back for community Medicaid. We do have a look back for nursing home Medicaid. That's a five year look back. Uh, and that has been in place for uh, many years, uh, actually since 2006. Uh, but we've never had a look back for community Medicaid. So what is a look back? Uh, what that means is when you apply for Medicaid, you need to, number one, uh, demonstrate that your resources are below the Medicaid limit. Again, right now, about $30,000. Now, if there were a look back, you would also have to disclose all of your financial activity uh, for the look back period. So if we had a 30 month look back, you would have to provide uh, 30 monthly statements for every bank account and every investment account. Uh, you would have to disclose your insurance policies, your trusts, uh, everything that you have of, of a financial nature. And the reason for that is Medicaid would be looking to see from all of this documentation whether you transferred ownership of any of your money or property to somebody else. And if you did so, uh, you are going to be subject to a penalty. Uh, the penalty being a denial of eligibility for a certain period of time. And that period of time uh, would be calculated by Medicaid based on the amount of money or property that you transferred to a third party during the look back period. Uh, so this has been with us again, as I said, for a long time uh, in the nursing home area. Uh, in every nursing home case where someone is applying to have Medicaid pay the nursing home bill, uh, we have to disclose five years, 60 months of financial information to Medicaid and uh, and determine whether there have been transfers of assets, which would result in a period of ineligibility. And you know that makes the application process pretty burn burdensome, particularly if there are a lot of accounts. Um, I uh, I always think about the client that we had several years ago who had ninety one bank accounts. I think we needed two wheelbarrows to deliver the Medicaid application to Medicaid. We had so much paper uh, showing 60 monthly statements for 91 bank accounts was 
a bit of a bit of an issue. Uh, anyway, uh, this uh, look back for community Medicaid was actually enacted by New York State Legislature back in April of 2020. And it has been delayed over and over again, uh, basically because of the uh, uh, COVID pandemic. And uh, now that we're out of the pandemic or coming out of the pandemic, I guess it's uh, open to discussion again, whether New York State is going to be implementing the uh, this 30 month look back that had been uh, legislated several years ago. Uh, so the latest date given to us was April 1 of 2024. But uh, Julie and I were um, at the New York State uh, Elder Law Section bar meeting uh, a few weeks ago. And they had, uh, I think, three of the Medicaid commissioners there uh, who told us that uh, this 30 month look back is uh, going to be delayed again to 2025. I think they put it as sometime in 2025 uh, or or at some later date. Um, anyway, I'm kind of betting that it may never get implemented, but we'll see. Uh, you know, we do have to uh, pay attention to the Obviously, we need to pay attention to the uh, scheduled dates. Uh, so if we're thinking about Medicaid right now, uh, it'd be a good idea to file that application before April 1st of 2024, although I think we'll be receiving further information from Medicaid about this look back uh, well before that. Uh, but that's the state of play at the moment. David. <laughs> Yeah. There was a question that just came through about um, the independent panel from before. The question says, once you're on Medicaid, the Medicaid panel determines your best living situation and not your own doctor? Um, we're talking about here. Um, we're really talking about the determination of you know, whether you need four hours a day of care or eight hours a day of care or something else, uh, that's that's the job of this uh, independent practitioner panel. There'll be a, a doctor or a nurse practitioner or somebody that the state has put on the panel who will be meeting with you and making an assessment of what your uh, care needs are. Uh, that's the goal and the, the job of the uh, of the independent practitioner plan panel. They're basically uh, trying to make more uniform, I guess, the, these results and taking the decisions away from, uh, you know, a, a lot of different parties that included your own doctor. And I think that importantly, one of the answers by the panel can be that a person cannot receive care from Medicaid safely at home. Again, Medicaid is not sending nurses to your home, right? They're just sending aides. And I think that's what this is getting at here. Um, so if they think that the care level is too high for aides, Medicaid can say, look, we're not going to be able to provide you home care through Medicaid, but you should apply for nursing home Medicaid. So yes, Medicaid can deny your home care, even if your doctor thinks maybe you can receive home care, um, because you're not entitled to these to these services. You have to go through this evaluation. Yeah, that's a very good point, Julia. And let me go back to one of the early slides for a moment. Um, this one here. I just want to mention the um, nursing home transition diversion program. Uh, and this is a special program where under the community Medicaid banner, uh, Medicaid is providing uh, 
nursing home level of care at home. And so there are some folks who would rather not go into a nursing home and would like to stay home, but who need a high level of care. Uh, that is available if you qualify uh, for this nursing home transition diversion program that uh, everybody refers to in Medicaid as the NHTD program. And it's a very good one. We've had a number of clients who've moved into that program. Right. And it's a waiver program, right? It's not through Medicaid, but in order to be eligible for this program, you need to be um, receiving community Medicaid. We need to know that you're in the system. And then from there, you would transfer to this program. You can't be receiving services from an MLTC. At the same time, you are receiving services from the waiver program. Right. And uh, anyway, it's it's a, an option to consider if uh, someone needs a high level of care and really uh, wants to stay home. And one of the one of the nice advantages on the financial side is we don't have to comply with the look back for nursing home care uh, because this NHTD program is part of community Medicaid. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to where I was. Uh, so, um, during the uh, COVID era, um, Medicaid was allowing uh, people to apply for Medicaid really without proving that they were Medicaid eligible. Uh, this was done uh, with an attestation. I swear that I'm eligible Medicaid, so please put me on your program. And it was kind of like that. Uh, and you can imagine that uh, there were probably quite a few people who were receiving benefits without really being eligible for those benefits. So Medicaid is, um, called an end to the so-called easement program or the shortcut program of simply attesting to your eligibility. Uh, so anyone who's applying for Medicaid now uh, better have complete documentation showing that they satisfy the uh, resource uh, requirements and, uh, and so on. Um, you know, I will say that during this easement period, uh, in our firm, we always uh, did the same work that we always do, which is to make sure that our clients are eligible, uh, which I think is why in the history of our law firm, we have never had a denial from Medicaid on an application that we prepared. And, you know, I think simply, uh, I shouldn't say simply, but I think what it requires is uh, care and diligence. And, uh, you know, as long as we're getting accurate information from a client, there's no reason why at the end of the day, we're not gonna be uh, having a successful application. Uh, and then, <clears throat> um, uh, terminations of coverage uh, during, uh, COVID, the uh, Medicaid was uh, prevented and foreclosed from reducing care, uh, but that's coming to an end, or I guess already has uh, come to an end. So those folks who have coverage who uh, are not eligible uh, are gonna find their, uh, their benefits terminated. And that's the end of the program. And I guess we have just a, a couple of minutes left for any further questions. Okay, wow, the chat's really been um, blowing up over here, but unfortunately it was configured so that only the hosts can see your questions. So I've been trying to copy and paste the questions and write answers. Um, I would just like to go over a question that I responded to earlier, but again, and David did go over this, but I just want it to be addressed again. 
David, the question here is, um, what is the level of equity you're allowed to have without a lien being placed? I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Julie? The level of what? Equity in a home that you can have without a lien being placed, which I think well, I the, want it to just make clear that there's never avoiding a lien. That's not an option. So, David, if you could explain that again. Yeah, well, the on the home equity, um, if you are applying for Medicaid, you're living in your own home, it's your primary residence, uh, it may be exempt as long as it is your primary residence. Uh, provided that your equity in the home does not exceed $1,033,000. So if you're living in a $2 million home uh, and you have no mortgage or financing against it, uh, you have $2 million in home equity and you're, uh, you know, 900 and over close to a million dollars in excess equity as far as Medicaid is concerned, that would be counted as a resource, uh, the excess amount above a million and $33,000. And in that case, uh, you would be denied Medicaid if you continue to own the home that has uh, excess uh, equity. Okay, great. And then we have some questions regarding whether we will ever be discussing nursing home Medicaid. Not today, but we would love to come back with PSS and discuss nursing home Medicaid at another time. Those set of rules are different and definitely would need their own hour to discuss. So we won't be covering it today, but please go to our website, www.cutner.com. We've been posting links to our website in the chat and you can find out a lot more information about nursing home Medicaid on there. Yeah, there's a, it's a different topic as uh, Julia said, and uh, you know we'd be happy to come back on another day and do a presentation about nursing home Medicaid. You know, the main feature is that look back, uh, which uh, can be problematical in many cases, although there are uh, different solutions to deal with it. And, uh, you know, people who have made transfers of assets and are told, oh, well, there's no way you're ever going to get Medicaid. Uh, you know, again, you ought to have a consultation with an elder law attorney before you act on that or fail to act because, uh, there are often solutions available that um, the person who provided that advice didn't know about. And Julia, did you wanna go over the some of the questions that didn't get answered on the Q&A? Because there are some good questions on there. Sure. Okay, so is there any way to negotiate a recovery with Medicaid? I.e., I can't sell, I'm sorry, there's a typo here. So I'm just trying to figure out what the person's saying. Let's just go with the first part. Is there any way to negotiate a recovery with Medicaid? Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, what happens is if Medicaid is making a claim for reimbursement, and again, the burden is on them to uh, claim that they're entitled to reimbursement. It's not automatic. And the approach to reimbursement claims can differ from county to county. So it, a little bit dependent too on where you live. But uh, you know, if you receive a letter from, and it's probably not gonna be from Medicaid, it's often from a collection agency or a collection law firm that is making that claim. And uh, the, they're very negotiable. Uh, they really would like to collect some money with the least amount of effort. And I'd say a typical settlement is probably gonna be something like 50 cents on the dollar. Uh, although we have settled cases for less than that. Uh, also, we should bear in mind that 
the claim is based on the expense that Medicaid has incurred and what Medicaid pays for nursing home care, for assisted living care, for home care is less and oftentimes substantially less than what you would have paid if you had been paying privately uh, because Medicaid negotiates uh, discounted rates with all of these providers that are, again, often lower and much lower than the private pay rates. So if you're paying 50 cents on the dollar, uh, it's really less than 50% than what you would have paid if you had been paying privately. So yes, it's negotiable and uh, it should be negotiated if there is such a claim. Okay, great. And then last one here. If my mom and I both own a home, so this is a jointly owned home between a son and his mother, can Medicaid, quote unquote, come for it? It's worth about $500,000. Well, uh, some other facts that we'd want to know here is the son living in the home. Uh, because if the son were living in the home, mom could transfer the house to him as an exempt transfer, and it would never be subject to, uh, to any claim. Um, and uh, otherwise, uh, you know, I think that's uh, something that could be uh, argued with Medicaid. The uh, son is not living again, there. Yeah, all right. Well, you know, in most cases, it's a question of eligibility. Um, you know, when Medicaid's looking at assets, they're determining whether you're eligible for Medicaid. So if mother and son uh, own the home and uh, mother is applying for Medicaid, uh, I don't think the son being an owner is going to be problematical there. But, you know, we ought to be thinking about transferring ownership here. You definitely should transfer ownership because although mom could be eligible if that's her only home due to the equity being below that million thirty three thousand threshold, it doesn't mean that when she moves out or goes to a nursing home or passes away that Medicaid won't place a lien on it. So you really should schedule a consultation with an elder law attorney and talk about how you can best protect that asset. Because yes, if you're receiving Medicaid and it's not in a trust or it hasn't been transferred properly, they can place a lien on it when it is not, not mom's primary residence anymore. And can I put in a plug for uh, not you know, you don't have to come to us, although I think we're very good, but uh, if you have questions and if you want to review what you've done and what you need to do, it really makes a huge amount of sense to have a consultation because a good elder law attorney will go through all of your, all of your situation. Where are you living? How much do you have in assets? Where do you want these assets to go? You know, what is your health situation? And it makes it, it's very, very useful to sort of wrap your head around where you are, what your risks are, and what you can do to mitigate those risks. So we, you know, when people have consultations, they come out feeling so good that they really understand where they are, what the risks are, and what they can do to, uh, to avoid those risks. So... Uh, thank, you, and um, thank you to PSS for having us today. Yes. We really appreciate it. A special thank you to Matt, who has been um, on with us today. And uh, we're grateful to have been here and hope to be here again soon. Yeah, we, we can, we're, we'll try and talk to him about uh, coming back and maybe talking about uh, nursing home Medicaid uh, in, a, in a month or so. Yeah, we or, can definitely talk about that. Back. Hopefully have you guys back. A big uh, virtual hand clap to uh, the firm of Lamson and Kuttner and uh, David specifically and Julia for helping out. That was tremendous. It was really information packed and I uh, can see just by the number of questions that you had that there's uh, a lot of interest in this. Uh, so thank you everyone for attending. Appreciate you hanging on these extra few minutes and please uh, again look at the PSS events page for upcoming events and we have something on Medicare next week. 
And with that, with that, we'll say goodbye for now. Thank you, everyone.